rugby is passion. The Guam rugby attitude and spirit is a very passionate one. The game of rugby is so much bigger than a game. There's something just special about being able to represent your own island, represent your home and your people. That is a big hit from Guam. Guam, quick tap and go. I'm very passionate about rugby. Sorry. Oh my gosh. Okay, that was a deep question. glasses on so I can't see squat. Yep, the great, and we had a ragtag bunch of guys there from Guam and a couple from Macau, one from Vietnam. My name's Ross Morrison, uh, I came to Guam in 1990, got involved in the rugby scene here on Guam 1994 and 1995. Uh, in those days there were quite a lot of uh, expat Kiwis, um, expat Australians and, and military contacts. So. Yeah, I've sort of been involved in the rugby since since its instigation in 1995. My name's Gregory David. Um, I'm the former president of the Guam Rugby Football Union, and I also dabbled in the black arts as a referee. So um, there was a core group of, of generally expat guys who got together. They had the motivation. It sort of started with the expats that came up from New Zealand, largely with the with the hotel building boom and late 80s, early 90s, and they were looking for a place to play touch. They were allowed to play on a little piece of ground just below Howells Field, but it wasn't very big, and they asked Parks and Rec, basically, can we develop this piece of land for rugby? I've been involved in, in rugby since the old boonie days. It was a motley crew of guys that used to get together. Um, we were always struggling to get 20 men on the team. With the military, the Navy ships coming in from mostly France, New Zealand, Australia, they would always be looking for a game of rugby. And occasionally Americans, but they didn't really play rugby that much. It was a, a mix of people who'd played rugby, who knew a little bit about rugby and knew a little bit about the rugby laws. And then um, they'd go out and they'd press gang, Marines, Coast Guard guys, Anybody that we could get, anybody with, with basically two legs and a pulse, um, and he, here's the ball, run with it. Um, and it made for some interesting times on the field. Um, that's where it started. Welcome to day two of the rugby program here at the National Stadium in Suva, where the extensive program starts with the quarterfinal sections, uh, the first of which sees Guam at New Caledonia, a match already in progress. That'll be followed in turn by Fiji. It's given infield Ryan Klaus and he quickly makes up the deficit with the plant down underneath the post. A grand piece of work and again speed being the optimum of sevens. He got a clear passage. This would become a sport for the island of Guam. Um, obviously, you know the Guam athletes. The, you know they have skills. They're physical. They love culture. They love sociability. They love nothing better to run over somebody. And as the years went on, more local guys got involved. We had to do a pitch to get the South Pacific Games here in 1999, which was done. To do that, we had to actually get a, a formal world body. So. 
in that formation period, 1998-1999, um, Guam Rugby Football Union was formed. The end result of how rugby is is exactly how we envisaged it when we when we got started. We really thought that it was a game of uh, a game that Guamanians would take to, and and we were able in three years to go from an idea to actually having a home, right, and having a sport and hosting the South Pacific Games. And, and I think that that's just a remarkable achievement by a, a, quite a dedicated group of people. I was brand new and I hardly knew a soul, but I saw an ad in the, in the, in the Guam Pacific News, you know, and, and it was an ad that says, if you're interested in rugby, we're having a meeting at Chuck Steakhouse at seven o'clock, right, get down there. So myself and my partner, we decided, I, well, she's Canadian, she didn't care two, two hoots, but I cared. So we turned up and, and there was this group of people who um, were, as like you say, from all over the world, right? Mainly, mainly uh, European people, right? Who had played the game of rugby in their various places. And they were regular touch rugby uh, players at a little section of Wettingale Field. And, um, they had heard that the South Pacific Games were coming in 1999 and the Guam National Olympic Committee had decided that they knew nothing about rugby, therefore rugby wouldn't be part of the Games. And, and Al Morrison said, hey, we should be part of the Games. It's so important to the rest of the Pacific. So that's why he called the meeting and that's why a group of us got together and um, and, and started working on it. And then Al and I presented to the Guam National Olympic Committee, and we convinced them that we would be able to, with our own endeavors, um, you know, our own effort, we would be able to provide the support and the infrastructure to allow rugby to be part of it. So that's that was the essence of getting rugby started. I think I saw like a rugby sticker in the back of a car or something like that. So oh, there's rugby going on, and then found out about there was rugby at Wedding Gale. Uh, and you know, that crowd was sort of as grassroots rugby as I think it gets, you know, guys sort of running around trying to get a field ready uh, for Pacific Games. 1999 and the SPG Games, that was the watershed, I think. That was when it went from ground zero to the next level. And then, then it, it, that was the foundation that people were able to build on. At that stage, um, you know, we're all quite green, some of us were still playing, um, but the excitement of um, those initial matches, people that had never seen rugby on Guam, you know, locals came out, we were very lucky, we had, we had um, three or four, you know, local boys. My big remembrance of 99 was watching, you know, FD football stars, Paul and Ryan Claris, uh, taking the field. Against what we all, everybody knew was sort of a great, you know, world-beating Fiji team. Sweet space, breaks through, can he make the tackle? It's given infield of Ryan Klaus, and he quickly makes up the deficit with it. If you played rugby before, yes, it's one thing is about speed, but another thing is just about kind of having a knack for it. And I think this having that kind of knack and elusiveness kind of helped us. So the coach, you know, approached us and said, "Hey, do you want to start training with us?" Um, we trained with them, and I mean, that's that's kind of. Where we're at at this point. So at that time, we had a lot of uh, older guys on the on the on the pitch. I mean, there were a lot of expats. So what it would be is that they would have, you know, families and uh, early morning stuff to do. So our trainings would roughly be about 4:30 in the morning. They would roll out. There was no lights, so Ross would roll out the, the portable <laughs> generator, the portable lights with the generator. Two of them, one on each side of the field, and we'll we'll play until 5:30, 5:45. Until the probably sun came yeah, out. Yeah, until the sun kind of peaked out, and then even before the sun fully came out, everyone's at home. Look, the rugby was a very high calibre. There were teams such as Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, um, very skillful South Pacific teams. You know, I think sort of these, these visions of, you know, either Paul or Ryan sort of running up the sideline as fast as they could, as a big Fijian guy would sort of chase him down, but, you know, holding their own, you know, almost getting close to that try line, you know, making these big runs was sort of, sort of seared in my mind. And I think even though that Fiji scoreline in that tournament wasn't the best for us, you know, sort of, First for Guam, I think all of us knew, probably through the example of the older guys that were on that team, but Paul and Ryan as the young guns on that team, you know, the 18-year-old kids, that, that we could play this game. I think that we felt a little bit of pride going in, and being that prideful and, 
and having, I mean, having that little experience and build up to it and then also being that young and also being local and being here on Guam, pretty nervous, pretty, pretty nerve wracking, I would think. It was a huge step forward for us, I think, in, in terms of just being a, a, an international athlete. Now you're an international athlete uh, and I'm playing on home soil. And honestly, when you look left, look right, you see your family. It's a huge kind of emotional thing, I think, uh, and, and no one really realizes, but at least for me, like every time we sing the national anthem, I have a tear in my eye, I have to. Anytime we play for Guam, and it, I mean, you always, especially here in Guam, like it was, it was such a moving, moving day for us. All right, we're gonna go out there. We're gonna represent Guam to the best of our ability and we're not gonna give up, we're not gonna quit because that's the exact opposite of what everyone on the island stands for. A year out from SVG, like I was really committed to that because yeah, we knew like, we were gonna play Fiji and Fiji were the best in the world at that time in sevens, um, still are. Yeah, going back to that that first um, that first test match that Guam ever played in, in the 15th stage, Guam versus India. Um, I was 16 years old. It, it was very tough. We're a new country going against uh, other nations that have much longer experience with this game. I mean, India is a good one. They had almost a century of experience playing the game. All of our performance indicators are there in terms of fitness, everything like that. Um, so we, going into the tournament, we really felt good about ourselves. We had a little bit more experience. Um, the problem was that everyone else had a lot more experience. <laughs> Just to, to know that I'm playing in front of my home crowd, 16 years old, against India. Perfect opportunity for, for people on home to express themselves. We had a huge training camp up with that. We had guys coming in from the States, Tony Gilbert, my brother, Casey, and whatnot. And we had, we had this huge idea that, oh, this is what we're gonna do, and guess what? We did. Everything in our head, that Pete said that we're gonna do, it all played out, like bang, at the breakdown, at this, the boom. Everything that we literally um, trained for, it happened. It was a learning experience for all of us. And more than anything, it was really seeing a higher level caliber of players and what you needed to do if you wanted to compete at that level. We knew what, before going in there, we knew everyone was physically tough. We knew the defensive aspect we, we can do well at. Uh, it was offensively and moving the ball we knew we'd have struggle. We'd struggle trying to score and move the ball forward, but I, we felt like if we capitalize on our defense, that that maybe would allow us to have success. We tied population 2 billion to population 200,000. We drew even 8 to 8. Vinnie Calvo slotted a penalty kick in that game that, that made sure we weren't going to come up short. Um, so it was really a, a surreal experience. And we had a good response to it. Um, you know, the result was not as expected. I mean, a tie is a tie. Well, I'll take that, but we wanted to win. But in terms of what we wanted, I think everything that we did, you know, we, 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 our game plan was good. We scored on our set piece, which is a really good thing. Um, yeah, but I thought that we, we really impressed. And I, I thought India was impressed with us. You know, and, and it was, it was just it, the nerves leading up to it. And I guess it could have been my age and the inexperience, but but walking away after that game, we tied India eight to eight. The biggest takeaway that I have that that India matches is a boost of confidence.
all of us had, had a basic love for the game uh, and we could see the values of the game, even though we came from, from different cultures. Uh, there was a common culture there with rugby. Um, that was number one. And number two is I think um, most of the people who were involved in, in, in trying to build rugby had the personality where they liked a challenge and they wanted to accomplish that challenge. You know, your community's only as good as what you put into it. And you've got to put into it to be able to pull out of it. Rugby's a, look, it's a great physical sport. Um, it's a great social sport. It's hard, but you need to be smart. But also, it's a great culturally, socially mixing sport. Right, you, you, you could beat somebody up for 80 minutes on a field. You know, they could beat you up for 80 minutes on a field. But there's something about that final whistle in a rugby world that sort of reminds everybody that we're part of a community. And, and, and and on an island that's built on community, that's premised on family, that's based upon sort of interacting with other people, you add that to this sport, it's a perfect mix.